So we can talk a little bit about the um, the telehealth visit and and some of the tips. So the the in person. Uh, that would be the the telepresenter, and I'll let you, Kyle, go through these. Sure. A lot of this is going to be redundant because it, both both groups are re, have certain things they have to consider. Yeah. So when I look at the, the in person provider or the telepresenter, you know, using the example as myself as an ATP, being with a client and maybe a caregiver in the home, I use this analogy a lot um, in, in different settings, whether what I'm working directly with a patient or in, even in a business setting, there's a, there's an acronym called AIDET, A I D E T, which stands for acknowledge, introduce, duration, exc- explanation, excuse me, and thank them. So as I'm doing that, understanding that one, I've got to be prepared for the visit. All this stuff we've been talking about so far is setting us up, um, for that telehealth visit. Now, again, proper, um, protocol, I should arrive early right? Expect for the unexpected, get everything prepared as best as I can, knowing that there may be some things and I have to be a little more maybe nimble um, when I get actually on site. But again, having that pre-screening, these preparation type activities will help mitigate some of those risks. At the end of the day, we want to really ensure that why we're here, um, the goals of this visit, and knowing that there is an open out for everybody. If there's not a comfortability factor, if we see something that we just cannot address uh, remotely, we need to be able to set that boundary um, and set that framework of comfortability as we go through um, that whole visit. So go ahead, Mark, from the remote perspective. Yeah. So if, as a remote provider, again, establishing the connectivity like, like you've done, but I think the introducing yourself and others is, is critical, especially in the remote setting. Like if you're in a clinic, there could be not just the therapist and the physician, but there may be residents, there may be trainees, there may be, you know, just other people that are participating. And I think remotely the, the consumer needs to know who's there who's listening. Yes. So for example, I will introduce myself and say, I'm the occupational therapist. I will be working with Kyle, who is the ATP, and you would have already introduced yourself. And I'll explain what my role is as an occupational therapist. I may then have the physician joining the, the encounter, and then I will let the physician introduce themselves. But in many instances, and one of the nice things about telehealth is we can also bring in our trainees. So I may have students, interns, medical students, therapy students, ATP students, and also getting permission, just like you would in person, do you mind if my student sits in on this evaluation? And sometimes we'll even tell them that at the screening, that the remote clinician or providers may have other people there with them. If that's not something you're comfortable with, that's not a problem. We, we just won't have them uh, present. So knowing who's, whose roles and responsibilities are, I'll even reiterate as the remote clinician that uh, you know, you, Kyle, are, are in charge. You are flying the airplane. If something isn't right, you are the one that's going to call that out and yep. either adjust or, or end the encounter and switch to uh, reschedule for, for in-person. So again, and then the goals and then assuring that there's verbal consent for, for everything. You know, the last thing I would add from maybe an equipment perspective is, you know, we talked about having that, that prep kit, right. And having all those prepared tools, stands, resources um, available as you're going into this, you know, as we arrive early, you know, that's a great opportunity to hop on the, the link, um, test the call, make sure the connectivity is there. Again, there's always a backup plan, right? Mm-hmm. There may be an internet service provider that they're doing maintenance and no one knew this was going to happen. So let's test it out. Even though I think there are some, um, advancements in operational efficiencies doing um, these remote type evaluations. Time is very, um, I guess, a a rare commodity. Uh, And when we look at that, we want to make sure I have all my equipment in the house, if I can, or in that environment that I don't have to be running back to my van or my vehicle to get that, that it's all there at our disposal. So we can make um, sure that that evaluation is as efficient as possible. So that's the last thing I would leave on, on that part, Mark. Yeah, the only part I'd add too is like, you're right, you don't know what could go wrong, the power could go out. But I think, you know, advanced communication, uh, usually with the the suppliers that we work on a routine basis, this does become very routine. They know that if the power goes out, and we don't have connectivity, they then take the responsibility to uh, get some good video. Yep. Uh, some still pictures, and then we can regroup afterwards and decide do we need to re 
is this a redo or do we have enough information to well that's a that's forward? a great comment mark and the last yeah. thing i would say on the still pictures is we've seen some evidence over the last couple of years of some really high quality high resolution photos in contrast to just the actual video that can be used in conjunction with the the uh, video um, to look at those environments to look at the actual positioning in that maybe chair or cushion back combo. So I think having that as an alternative method um, or just simultaneously um, use, I think is a very valuable tool. Yep. Yeah. And just some other, you know, tips, it gets in kind of like the manners, the etiquette, you know, uh, again, everybody introduce yourself, uh, show your ID badge. I, I tend to do that also. I, I think that's part of protocol. The, just like you're wearing your ID badge in person, the, the client, you know, it's an assurance that who I am and what I'm doing and I work for the medical center um, is important. Uh, again, reminding that the encounter can be stopped at any point. Anybody can stop it. If it's if it's not right, then we stop and we, we regroup and we figure out it may be you need to come into clinic or we need to look at some other um, strategies for, for doing the evaluation. Uh, as a provider, it's important to look straight into the camera. I think the, the consumer client appreciates that it shows that you're attentive and you're paying attention to them you know uh, other things visually you know like a, a solid background like a computer generated one like I'm, I'm using right now wearing solid colors um, again consider that a lot of the clients we work with may not see well they're older the screen may be may, may be small so those are important uh, you know glare can often be an issue so good lighting towards your face is, is, is always good. And another one is just avoid any background, you know, pay attention to background noises. But I think when you're making the initial connection, if there's issues with sound, uh, they'll become obvious and you can usually mitigate them pretty quickly. You know, I just, I want to emphasize, Mark, the, the part you made or the point you made about looking into the camera and how important that is for the perception of that patient and or caregiver in the home, even the ATP supplier. I've so often in this remote world we work in now, um, working with individuals and different organizations that are looking, they're engaged, but they're looking at a different screen. To me, it doesn't feel like it though. And, and I think it's so important, especially being a remote provider, if, you, if that's the clinician, um, of trying to really humanize and know that you may have just this one interaction with this individual and you need to make the most out of it and making sure you are addressing the needs and making them feel comfortable with who you are and that you're here for them. So looking at the camera, I think it is as best as you can do um, to make that uh, personal connection with them. So I'll, I'll leave yeah. it at that though, Mark. Yeah, position your camera in the right spot. So, <laughs> because you, we tend to look right straight at, right at our screen, but the camera right. may be off to the left or right. So Correct. that's, that's a good one. Um, I think I'm going to handle this one too, but the, you know, be aware of transmission pauses. Sometimes you may have some blips or whatever in the, the connectivity, um, direct the questions directly, uh, you know, to a person. So like, Kyle, I'm asking you, how wide is that doorway? I'm not asking the caregiver or the client. They, it, it's well known. And then ensure that they understood the, what you said. And, and sometimes just repeating back, just, just like any communication did, you know, to clarify that you understood what I said, or if you're, if, if something's not happening the way it should is just stop, pause and make sure that the direction or the question was, was understood and, and pointed to the right person. Um, as a, tell a provider, um, you know, avoid side conversations. Um, I know sometimes you have to pause for a moment because someone walked into your office or there's an urgent issue, but mute, mute the phone if needed, or just say, hold on folks, I'm going to pause for a moment, but just not doing that again, sends a potential message to the consumer that you're really not engaged or you're not paying attention or you're busy doing other things. And I know, we're all guilty of multitasking when we're on Zoom calls and other things. But when you're doing telehealth with a consumer, you really have to pay careful attention to that and make sure you're attentive throughout. And then again, backup communication plans, like we mentioned, sometimes there's a landline uh, that you can use. Um, a lot of the tele-providers or telepresenters also bring a second phone or a, a second source of uh, internet, you know, a MIFI, for instance, if, if uh, the system you're using goes down. And again, it's not very expensive. Uh, and it's also 
way less expensive than having to reschedule an appointment, especially if it's in a very remote area. And then the emergency plan, I think that's just good biz, good practice for all of us. And oftentimes that is, you know, 911. Or again, if it's a rural area, you know, verifying with the consumer, if something goes wrong, do you have 911? Or is there another number that needs to be called? Is there a family member or a neighbor nearby we can contact, as well as the emergency services? You know, there's two things, Mark, that struck a chord with me. One is that transmission delay. Just from experience, how frustrating it is when people are talking over each other, or you're waiting for a few seconds before that's responded. So again, I think it behooves us to have that that pre test pre-test call, pre-screen, even before that appointment to look at that connectivity and making sure you're waiting for that response. It feels really awkward, but it's a necessary evil sometimes. And the last thing is you talked about um, ensuring that communication and everything's understood is, you know, ensuring that not only the patient understands that they can relate the, or um, repeat that back to you, but also maybe that insight, that telepresenter, maybe it's an ATP supplier, making sure they understand that everybody's on the same page. So all that, I think, very well said, Mark. Yep. Yep. So that pretty much concludes uh, module three. Um, I think we've we've covered most of it. This again is is more the the etiquette, logistics, communication. I think um, you know since the public health emergency two years ago, video conferencing and remote uh, interaction is becoming more commonplace. So some of this may seem like it's very just common sense because we've been doing it for a while. But I think for anybody new coming into the field of 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 assistive technology, anybody coming into the field of healthcare, telehealth is going to be with us uh, for the the future. And there's just some subtle things that you have to be aware of when you're video conferencing for the purposes of taking care of a person's health needs versus uh, just having a general Zoom meeting or Teams meeting. But I think the a lot of the etiquette is is common to all of those platforms. But we have to be especially aware and cognizant when we're providing telehealth. Any closing words, Carl? No, Kyle? I think this was great. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Mark. Great. Thanks, everyone.